Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. So I'm going to present an ongoing project of mine which is on a completely different topic. Um, in this paper, what we're gonna do is investigate how the incentives that newspapers have to sell their content through subscription depends on their relying, reliance on advertising revenues. So I should stress that this is joint work, joint work with Julia Caget. She's now an assistant professor in Paris. We're both economists by training and we started this project when we were at, at Harvard. So I probably don't need to convince you that the media industry, uh, including the newspaper segment of it, is an important industry. It's an important industry both because of the share of GDP it represents and because uh, of the role it plays, right? So it informs the political debate, etc. And it's also an industry which is in crisis, so we've all read about newspapers firing their journalists, uh, their profitability has been going down, etc. And there's a number of reasons that has been advanced to explain this, this crisis. You know, television, the, you know, the, the rise of television back in the days, and of course since, since the 90s and, to, and year 2000, the advent of internet. And one reason that is repeatedly being put forth is basically the decline in advertising revenues that this competition triggered. So, for instance, advertising expenditure on, on US daily print, US daily newspapers has been decreasing by roughly 30% since, since 2000. So this is a major, major uh, you know, state of distress. So just to continue on that, here I basically depicted the US newspapers advertising revenues as a share of GDP since, to, since 1950. So there's clearly a downward uh, trend, right? And this trend has been more pronounced since 2000. Since I'll be using French data, I also wanted to show you the equivalent data for France. So basically the same thing is happening. Down, clear downward trend, there's no question that advertising revenues have been going down. So we're going to be approaching this problem as, as economists, so we're going to be using an economic uh, paradigm. And newspap the newspaper industry, whether the, oops, whether we look at the print or online version of it, is interesting from an economic theory because we tend to treat it as platforms. And the sort of terminology that we use is two-sided market, so we view newspapers as platforms that need to attract two distinct types of consumers, at least two distinct types of consumers, namely readers and advertisers. And presumably both group of consumers cares about the presence of the other and its characteristics. So for instance, you know, advertisers prefer to have more readers than less readers, and maybe readers like or dislike advertis advertisements. So this leads to network effects. So what I mean to say by that is that the prices that will be charged on one side of the industry, say the readers, will reflect not only the preferences of the readers and the cost of supplying the content to readers, but it will also reflect some uh, specificities of the other side of the industry. So for instance, it's sort of commonly thought, and it, it actually there's a lot of empirical evidence for that, that the prices that are charged to readers are actually lower compared to a counterfactual world in which advertising doesn't exist, right? The idea is that advertisers want to target a lot of readers, so they, they're willing to subsidize readers. So in fact, this, is, this, could be, this effect can be so pronounced that readers can, be, can pay a price which is below the cost of serving them. So we, we can think, for instance, of the free, free newspapers. So from the newspaper, another salient feature of the, of the newspaper industry is also the fact that newspapers sell their content both through subscription and on occasions to, uh, f at, for instance, at the newsstand to, to readers, right? So I mentioned that there were two sides to this industry. In reality, we, if we want, we can actually divide the reader side of the industry into two subgroups, the readers, the, uh, the, sorry, the subscribers and the occasional readers. So it's typically the case, in fact, I'm not aware of any other situation that the per unit subscription price, so what I mean by that is the subscri subscription price divided by the number of units that the subscription gets you to access is lower than the, the newsstand price, right? Or, and online is the same, right? If you subscribe to have access to the full content of a newspaper, this is typically, if you normalize this by the number of uh, articles that gets you, this is typically lower than the price of, charge of paying to have access to only one article. So I'm not going to go into the reasons why this is the case. In fact, some of these re reasons are pretty straightforward, but I just want to emphasize that this is a salient feature of, of this industry. 
And in fact, there's empirical evidence that recently, more or less for the past 10 years, the price gap, so the difference between the per unit subscription price minus the, uh, uh, and, uh, and the newsstand price has been going up. So it seems that newspapers are trying, sometimes successfully, to basically sell more and more of their content through subscription. So they want to adopt a, reader ba a subscriber based readership, basically. So there's, a, been a, there's been a change in their business model, basically. So, for instance, in the 50s, I, I think that only 30% of readers would subscribe, and now the share is much higher. So, in this paper, what, w what we're interested in is understanding how, so sort of, the, sort of the broader question we're asking ourselves is, how do the prices charged to readers depend on the, on the advertisers, in a very general sense? In particular, what we're, we're uh, understanding is how do the, what we're interested in understanding is how do the incentives that newspapers have to sell more and more of their content through subscription depends on the willingness to pay of advertisers for the, for the newspaper. So the challenge, the empirical challenge when doing that is basically that we need to isolate the advertising revenues effect from all possible other effects. So for instance, increased competition, et cetera. So that's a bit of a, uh, of a hard thing to do. So in this paper, what we do is that we use a historical event. So this is going to be using data from the 60s and 70s. What we exploit is the fact that in France in 68, the French government decided to introduce advertising on French television. So I'll, I'll give you more details about, about that. And what we will be doing is that we'll consider, and we'll, I'll show you evidence that this is, this is plausible, that this was a negative shock on the advertising revenues of newspapers. And we're going to be exploiting the difference between national newspapers and local newspapers. And we will be under the, under the presumption that national newspapers were hit much harder than local newspapers because basically the, the, the ads that you would find in them are much more likely to, to go on TV. So let me give you a preview of the data we have. We have basically, so in France, back in the 60s and 70s, you had roughly 100 newspapers. You have 10 national newspapers and 90 local newspapers. So national newspapers in France, basically what, I guess a correct <laughs> description of what we mean by a national newspaper is a Parisian newspaper sold on the entire uh, territory, okay. but and it, and it doesn't cover Parisian news, but it is biased towards uh, Parisian uh, readership. And local newspapers are basically you can buy them only in like local counties, etc., and not not in Paris, for instance. So we have data on all national newspapers and 80% of local newspapers. We have all the most important uh, local newspapers, so we cover 90% of circulation. So we ha what we have is basically the balance sheet information, so we have revenues and cost, and something which is important for what we want to do, we have the breakdown between advertising revenues and sales revenues. What we have also is prices, so we know the subscription price, we know the newsstand price, and we know the advertising prices, advertisement prices, and we have the share of subscribers for each newspaper. And also we've been doing some content analysis, so I, I did part of it, and then we hired some uh, arrays. Basically, we we scanned a subset of all these newspapers and we, uh, comp we basically uh, computed all the, the quantity and the types of advertisements that you would find in newspapers back in the days. So in terms of descriptive statistics, the, uh, as I said, the average share of subscribers is about 30% back then. Uh, those, not surprisingly, the, pr the subscription price is lower than the newsstand price. It's about 80%. 86% of it. And I just want to emphasize that advertising revenues are, or even though the data is a bit dated, um, advertising revenues are already a huge deal to newspapers. They represent 46% of, to of total revenues, right? So they really depend on this source of income. And this is reflected in the quantity of ads you would find in the newspapers. You basically, on average, you'd find two pages uh, dedicated to ads in French newspapers back in the days, which is about 11% of the total surface of the newspaper. So this is a major, major dimension of, the, of their business. And I just want to emphasize that this industry is not in a crisis yet, at, the, at least in terms of readership. So circulation is pretty flat, and there's little entry and, and little exit. So let me tell you a bit about what happened in terms of the reform on television. So 
the television industry in France back in the days is very rudimentary. You only have a couple of channels, one of, one of two. And uh, this is a period in which not all French households basically own a TV, but they increasingly do so. And TV is state owned and, and financed through ta taxation until 68. But because the French government wants to introduce a third TV channel, they're basically running out of money. And so what they, what they decide to do is introduce advertising uh, in, in October 68. So pre-68, there's no, you cannot find any advertising on French uh, television with some exceptions. So this, this reform is announced in October 67 and it's implemented in uh, 1968, in a year later. So here I've depicted a number of minutes you would find on, uh, on French television. So not surprisingly, before 68, you have zero minutes of, ad of ads per day. In 68, you have two minutes. Then in 69, you have four minutes, then eight minutes, and, it, and the increase uh, never stops. So as I said, we view this as, so first of all, we view this as, a, as something which is exogenous to the, to the newspaper industry. So the, the reason why the government decided to introduce advertising on, on television had nothing to do with the state of the newspaper industry. It was to, in order to finance this third channel. And presumably, we view this as a, as a negative shock, right? So Advertisers now have an, an additional uh, platform on which they can put their ads, and this can only be a bad thing for, for the existing uh, platform. The, and what we will be exploiting is the fact that national newspapers, as I said earlier, will be more severely hit by this change than uh, local newspapers. So in essence, I don't, want to, I don't want to go through the details, but basically you'd find much more local ads in local newspapers than what you would uh, find in, in national newspapers. And this is even more pronounced if you, if you introduce also classified ads. So if you also take into account classified ads, they're much more important to local newspapers than they are to national newspapers. So what I mean to say here is that national newspapers depend much more on advertisers that are more susceptible to go and put their ads on TV. So just some sort of... Uh, anecdotal, almost anecdotal evidence that this is indeed a negative shock that affects the national newspapers. Here I basically plot the bars represent the advertising revenues as shares of total revenues to both national and local newspapers pre and post shock. So it's clear that, so local news is pre, it's sort of flat. And national newspapers, but well basically the, the share of advertising revenues goes down quite severely. If we, if we plot, if we look only at aggregate, sorry, if we just look at aggregate advertising revenues, because we have, I just want to emphasize that France back then is actually experiencing a boom, right? So the economic growth is very high, so advertising revenues in, in their aggregate are actually growing. So local newspapers are, uh, are enjoying this, this, uh, this growth. So is television, but that's sort of mechanic. But actually, national newspapers are hit so hard that the, uh, their aggregate uh, revenues collapse. Well, no, no, collapse, but they decrease by, uh, by a severe amount. Okay, so this, this should convince you that this is indeed a negative shock on national newspapers and much less, less so on local newspapers. So just a few words on the methodology. We actually do other things in, in, the, in the paper, but that's the, the sort of, uh, that's the methodology we use to sort of pitch the paper. We're basically going to compare the pre-68 to post-68 change in prices of nas national newspapers to that of local newspapers in the same period of time. So the underlying assumption is that there is a common trend, pre-shock, and that the, the reform will basically break the, the common trend post-shock. So as graphical illustration of what, what I have in mind, here I depict the price ratio. So what I mean is the per unit subscription price divided by the newsstand price, right? So this, this measures almost mechanically the extent to which uh, the readership is subscriber-based. So the lower is the ratio, the more it, it pays to basically subscribe to the newspaper. So there's obviously, I think it's quite clear that there's a common trend up to 68, and that this, this trend is no longer common uh, post-introduction post of advertising on, uh, on French television. So we can already see something which is, uh, which is happening, is that the price ratio of national newspapers is collapsing. So post-introduction of advertising on French television, I'm anticipating on the, on the empirical results, but national newspapers seem to react by decreasing the subscription price compared to the newsstand price. So 
the ad there's a collapse in advertising revenues and the way that national newspapers react is by trying to have more subscribers. So, of course, then we, we, we run regressions controlling for a bunch of things, uh, you know, newspaper characteristics, et cetera. And so what are the main, away, the, the main takeaway points? I don't want to go through the, uh, the details. So this decrease in the price ratio of national newspapers compared to local newspapers is, is confirmed if you run a regression with a bunch of controls. Uh, so it's, it's highly significant, et cetera. So here, here I just regressed the, uh, the price ratio. If we look at prices individually, so the first column are the newsstand price, these are the subscription prices, and these are the advertising prices. Here I'm dividing the period under consideration into three sub-periods, pre-shock, the three first years after the shock, and the, and the long run. Okay. So what we see first is that, so if you look at the first line, there's no effect of the introduction of advertising in 68 on the pricing choices of national newspapers pre-68. So this is reassuring as to the validity of the, uh, of the empirical analysis. There is no anticipation effect. The second thing which, which, uh, which is striking is that the newsstand price is, uh, is unchanged. So, there's, so basically the, the change is not significant. So news, national newspapers do not change the price they charge in newsstand. What they do, however, is decrease significantly the subscription price. This is true both in the short run and in the long run. So that's how they react to the decrease in uh, advertising revenues. Not surprisingly, there's a collapse in the advertising prices, right? Yeah. So advertisers have an extra platform where they can put their ads. So now the prices that newspapers are able to charge advertisers has gone down. Now, in terms, this, in a sense, this is <laughs> the results that I find the most uh, intriguing and, uh, and interesting. If we look at what happened to advertising in advertisements in these in new newspapers, what we find is that newspaper, national newspapers react to the decrease in, in uh, advertising revenues by actually increasing the quantity of ads that you would find in their pages. You know? So this is the second column. However, what they also do is also increase the number of pages of newspapers. So what I'm saying is that they increase the content that readers care about, right? More sports, more art, I don't know. And in fact, they do that in a way that the share of ads in the newspaper is, is basically unchanged. So the here, the effect is not statistically significant. So summarizing, what happened back in the days is that national newspapers, following the decline in advertising revenues, reacted by actually increasing the quantity of ads, but also increasing the content to readers so that so that the proportion of content to, to uh, ads is actually left unchanged. Okay, so this is not what we were expect expecting at all because as economists, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is that you know, if the willingness to pay of my buyers goes down, I'm going to sell less of the product to them. You know? So there's also a theory component to our, to our project. So, uh, so here, basically, what we do is you know, an applied game theoretic uh, framework. So let me just give you the main elements of what we do and why and how we use this to basically try to make sense of what we observe. So we, we develop a re relatively simple model with a monop monopolist newspaper interacting with a set of advertisers and a set of readers. Uh, we assume, so this is, we assume that readers are sort of heterogeneous in their willingness to pay for, uh, for the newspaper. And we also, so this is going to be a repeated, uh, repeated game. And every day there's a shock on their willingness to read, right? So these are political events, sport events, et cetera. Their willingness to pay fluctuates over time. And the advertisers, they're also heterogeneous in their willingness to pay for, uh, for uh, newspapers. And I mean, we, we try different things, but we sort of maintain the assumption that they prefer more readers to less readers which I think is sort of plausible. So let me get you the So we allow the newspaper to, to sell. In fact, this is important because this is what we're interested in. We, we allow the newspaper to sell its content both through subscription or on occasions to readers through newsstands. And OK. So let's try and make sense of what we've observed empirically. If you agree with me that 
the introduction of an alternative platform for advertisers is sort of equivalent to a decrease in the willingness to pay of advertisers for the, uh, for the uh, incumbent platform. It's a little bit surprising that we would observe in decrease in the, so one thing which is surprising is that we would observe a decrease in the prices charged to readers. So remember that the newsstand price is unchanged, but the subscri subscription price decreases. So the reason is as follows. Um, if I'm the newspaper and I want to attract advertisers, I have to sell, I have to give them a lot of readers. If their willingness to pay for that is pretty high, I'm going to do it, right? So that means that I'm going to charge prices that are below what are uh, readers that are below what I would charge them if advertising didn't exist. Now, if my advertisers' willingness to pay for space in my newspaper goes down, we wouldn't expect that newspapers react by giving them even more of what they want, right? I should, if these guys are less willing to pay for space in my newspaper, I should cater less to what they want. And so I should react by, um, by actually sort of increasing the prices I charge to readers towards what I would charge them if advertising didn't exist. So this is, if you were to write down a very simple model, it would be extremely difficult to get out of this logic, right? So if your willingness to pay for something goes down, I'm, I'm not going to cater more to what you want. No, this, this super simple logic is very difficult to actually uh, sort of circumvent. And this is, this is also true for the quantity of advertising. Why would I sell more of <laughs> advertising? Why would I give more importance to ads in my newspaper if I'm getting less money out of it? I should have done it before if doing so now is so lucrative. So we augment the, the theory the model by basically allowing the following thing, we're going to continue assuming, of course, that advertisers prefer more readers to less readers, but we're going to assume that advertisers actually dislike other advertisers, no? which you know, now that I say it, it sounds pretty plausible. If I put an ad in a newspaper, I don't want my ad to be, for instance, next to a direct competitor's ad, right? Or more generally, I don't like my ad to be one of a million ads. Uh, I like exclusivity, I value exclusivity. So if Pre-shock, I'm the newspaper again. My uh, advertisers come to me and they say, okay, I want to put an ad in your newspaper, but I also want exclusivity. You know, maybe not extreme exclusivity. I don't want to be the only one, but I don't want many other ads. And I'm willing to pay a lot of money for that. So newspapers, they're actually pretty happy because that means that they're getting a lot of money out of a few advertisers without imposing too much ads on readers. Okay? So now suppose that introduction of advertising on television occurs, there's an alternative platform for their, these advertisers. Now they're less willing to pay for both readers and exclusivity. So now what newspapers will do is say, okay, you're giving me half the money of what you were giving me before for exclusivity, I'm no longer going to give you exclusivity, right? So I'm going to increase the quantity of ads, even if that means not giving exclusivity to anyone. But then mechanically, this would increase the quantity of ads that I'm imposing on readers if they dislike that, I have to decrease the prices that I'm charging them to keep them on board. Okay, so this is one possible rationalization of what happened and how we can explain both a decrease in reader prices, which as I said is at first surprising, and together with a, an increase in the quantity of ads. Okay, just the concluding uh, remarks. I just want to say a few words about what, so we're doing a bunch of other things in the in the paper, for instance, we're actually also testing whether the money that the government is raising through ads is used to increase the, qu the quality of television, in which case it will also have an effect on the willingness to pay of readers to, uh, for, for the newspapers. What we're going to do now is, so we're going to change methodology, I mean, do uh, implement another one, we're going to do something which is called a structural analysis. So basically what that means is that we're going to posit that newspapers compete in some, in some ways we're going to plug all the, all the things we know, so we know prices, we know quantities, uh, we know revenues, et cetera. And we're going to infer from this the remaining parameters that we don't know, namely preferences of advertisers and preferences of readers. And we're hoping that this will basically enable us to understand what really happened back in the day. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>